Can you give to God? Really? Is it even possible to give to God? What do you do? Write a check? Stick it in an envelope? Write God on the front of it? Put a stamp on it and put it in the mail? Well, it's absurd, but there's one thing about it, it won't damage your bank account very much. But if it were not possible to give to God, why would he command that we do it? Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. You hear this every year at festival time when we come together. Three times a year all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Tabernacles. No man should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Is it the law? Yes. Is it voluntary? Yeah, it is. Who decides what the appropriate proportion is? You do. Nobody else would be able to do it. Now, before I get into this, if you are one of those people who get upset or angry when a minister talks about money, I would suggest that if you're here, you can go get a cup of coffee and wander out in the parking lot. If you're at home, uh, just take the CD out, go out and use it as a Frisbee. Uh, turn it off right now. There's no point in your listening any further. If that really type of thing really bothers you, because I am going to bother you. And if you have become so cynical that you think that I'm talking about this to increase the income to CEM, please, I will ask you, don't send us any money. Can we put that behind? Put it over on a shelf somewhere. Find somewhere else to give, but lay aside your cynicism long enough to hear me out. Now let's get something else out of the way to start. What if you are too poor to give? I'm not sure that's possible, and I'll explain why, but let's consider the implication. First, did you consider the term in proportion? Actually, if you don't know what, you're, you know, you, what you make, what you have to sacrifice, what you have to give in relation to what some guy like Ross Perot would have to give in order to be at the same level of self-sacrifice, it's a totally different amount of money. And we get a surprising amount of gifts in here that are $1, $2, $5 of people, and that's all they have to give, and people give anyway. So the second thing I think we have to consider, though, is what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 8. If any man provide not for his own, especially for his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, this is what Jesus was driving at when he spoke of the Pharisaic tradition of Corban. You may have heard of that. Mark 7, verse 13. Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say... That if a man says to his father or mother, well, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me, it is Corban. That is, it's a gift devoted to God. Then you no longer have it, require him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do all sorts of things like this. Okay. Jesus obviously expected a man to take care of his mother and his father and the man had no business shorting them to give to God. That's what he's saying, isn't it? That you don't cut your mother and father off and say, oh, well, I'm sorry, I had to give this money to God while your mother and father are not properly being taken care of. One of the things I think is not perhaps as well understood as it should be that the honor your father and your mother has to do as much with supporting them as it does with saying nice things about them or thinking good thoughts about them. It has to do with taking care of your mother and your father. But how is, often is it that we are so close to the line that we have absolutely nothing to give? And if you are managing your affairs that poorly, is that really an excuse? Well, let's take another step to clear the air. Psalm 50, verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am your God. I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices or burnt offerings that are before me. In other words, I'm not telling you to stop giving offerings. That's not my point. 
But I want to tell you this. I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The world is mine and everything in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? <laughs> Don't be silly. Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor me. We have a deal. Now, is this clear? If the offerings are not for God's benefit, and they certainly are not, are they? He said, if I were hungry, do you think I'd tell you? Give me a break. If they're not for God's benefit, then for whose benefit are they commanded? Obviously, for the giver. For everyone needs to give. Now, I don't know if that's as clear to us as it ought to be. Every human being has a need to give. And if you're not doing it, if you're just exercising selfishness, you are hurting yourself and nobody else. Blessed is the child who is taught to overcome his na natural selfishness and to share. It needs to be taught from the first time they have a chance and be after them until they're grown up and out of your house. Consider this for Jesus, from Jesus. Mark 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put. Mark 12, verse 41. And he watched the crowds putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything all she had to live on. You realize what he said? And it's interesting sidelight to this. He didn't give her offering back to her for that would have been deny her the right to give and to fulfill her need to give to God in the relationship we have she had with God. He would have taken away from her where she stood, where God might very well come around and bless her in ways that would be way beyond giving her offering back to her. What does he mean, though, when he says that she has given more into the treasury? Surely not. She gave more in proportion to what she did. She didn't give more into the treasury, did she? I'm not so sure. I'm really not so sure. Jesus does not look on the raw amount of the gift. He looks upon the proportion of the gift in relation to the person giving to them. Now, the passage doesn't stop there. Verse, 20, verse 5. I'm sorry. Luke 21, 5, but it's the other version of it. Some of his disciples remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said... As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on top of another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Conclusion. The building doesn't matter. The building is not what's important. What is important? It is the relationship between the giver and God. That's what this whole thing is all about. Now about the widow's offering. God can do more with a little bit than you might think. Remember, the, what do you think this particular incident is in the Bible for? Remember it, you know it well enough. They're out on the hillside, way up north in Galilee, far away from any food, inn, restaurant, or anything else, and the people are hungry. And Jesus said to his disciples, give them something to eat. And they said, well, I don't have anything. He said, well, what do you have? They had five loaves and two fish and 5,000 people. Jesus fed them all with that. Now, what do you think he can do with your $2 offering? If your offering is given in comparison, you know, out of proportion to what you have, God is able to multiply it and take it places you would never have thought about it going and to accomplish good with it you couldn't even imagine. And this is the thing I think we need to understand, all of us do, from the richest to the poorest. We all have a need 
to give. And the poor need to give and have it appreciated as much as the rich person is appreciated. This is something I think really people need to get through their heads. It's not easily done because we are so wrapped up in this world and the things in it that we lose track of the relationship between ourselves and God. Now, I'm persuaded that God can do more with $2 from a poor widow than $100 from a person with money to burn. But when we think of proportion, what proportion are we talking about? Okay, let's walk through this. Genesis 14 Verse 17. Now the story began with Lot having gone down to Sodom, and then there was an invasion in the area from some kings of the east, and they took, carried the whole gang of them captive, took all the looty, loot, loot and booty out of uh, Sodom, and took off for home. Abraham put together a private army, went out and fought them, defeated them, got all the stuff back, and probably then some, and headed back home with all of them, including Lot. Well, as Abraham returned, verse 17, Genesis 14, from defeating Kedorlaomer and the kings, kings with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. That's sort of reminiscent of the Passover in a way, isn't it? He brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. Blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now take your time and read that entire story, Genesis 14, when you get a chance. Read all the way through it from beginning to end. It's really noteworthy that what Abraham is tithing on in this case is the spoils of battle. He went out and fought, he and his men, what they, what they took was theirs at this point. It was the property, technically speaking, of the people of Sodom. They lost it, but God gave it into his hands. So he gave God a tenth of the whole business that was there. For the first time in their lives, the kings of Sodom tithed, but Abraham did it for them. Now, what's really interesting to me about this, the king of Sodom, well, before I go on, Melchizedek was a priest of God. God gave it into the hands of Melchizedek, and he gave God a tenth. Genesis 14, 21, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God, most high creator of heaven and earth. I have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not a thread or the thong of a sandal, so you will never be able to say I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them have their share. Interesting. Abraham took the tenth for God off the top. Then everything else was divided after the tenth was given to God. But the important thing about, about this to notice is Abraham's tithe was in response to the declaration of Melchizedek, blessed be the most high God who has given you the victory. Abraham felt he had to acknowledge that and the way he acknowledged it was with the tithe. Okay, put a marker there. And let's move on to the next waypoint, Genesis 28. Now we come to Jacob and the story about how Jacob happened to be where he was on this night where he went to sleep with his head on a rock for a pillow, which I don't know, no wonder he had dreams. Uh, but he saw a ladder ascending up into heaven with angels going up and down the ladder. And he said, wow, he woke up. He said, man, this is the nothing in the world, but this is, the Lord is in this place. And I didn't even know it. Genesis 28, 16. He was afraid. He said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, which is what the name Bethel means. And I presume this is where it came from. Uh, Jacob rose up early in the morning. He took the stone he had put for his pillows, set it up for a pillar, poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me, 
Keep me in the way that I go. Will give me bread to eat, raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. This stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give the tenth to you. Now, someone read that and argued, well, it's not tithing in response to a law. His tithe was voluntary. He just decided that's what he wanted to do, do and he made a vow, and it was a vow. Well, first, how do you know he wasn't responding to it as a law? Doesn't say one way or the other. Second, the argument's irrelevant, meaningless. Brace yourself. This may come as a bit of a jar. Conformity of every, or two, every law of God to, uh, affecting the individual is voluntary. Tithing is voluntary. So is keeping the Sabbath. There aren't any Sabbath police around here. Now, Nehemiah had some in his day, but we're not in Nehemiah. We're in a non-Sabbath keeping society today. There's nobody watching you on that to see to it you do it. Keeping the holy days, voluntary. So many things that you do are voluntary. Telling the truth is voluntary. Now, what happens if you don't do it? Consequences. You can destroy your, your reputation by lying. You know, and by the way, that whirring sound you hear is someone spinning off into space after me saying that keeping the Sabbath is voluntary. They think of it as being mandatory. Oh, it's just words. It's a commandment of God, but you are free not to keep it. That's what I mean by voluntary. Same thing is true of tithing. The law of God that regulate our relationship, the laws that regulate our relationship, sorry, to society have direct enforcement. Thou shalt not kill for example, and you shall not, you know, swear falsely against your neighbor. That's against the law as well, and it can be enforced. The rest of the law has consequences that are not always apparent. Now, back to Jacob and his tithe. Jacob is entering a covenant with God. He makes a vow. He makes a promise. It's actually a classic if-then statement. Listen to it again. If God will be with me and keep me in the way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, raiment to put on, so I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone will be his house, and of all you give me, I will surely give the tenth to you. Now, how did he calculate what God had given him? I don't know. Wasn't that up to him? Wasn't it his decision to make? in good faith before God, in keeping with his vow? Well, of course it was. He had to work that out for himself. There is a burning question here. A man is entering into covenant with God, which is a partnership with God. I mean, what's the value of being in business and having God as your partner? Man, what part of life does a man want to, ex you know, to exclude from his covenant with God? How about your children? You don't want them tucked in under that covenant? What about your house? His mule. The one he plows his green. You want that excluded from the covenant with God? His business? His money? I got a cartoon somewhere in my computer I copied out. This guy's down in the water with the preacher, and the preacher's got his hand up in the air, ready to baptize the guy. He says, everything that goes under the water belongs to God pushes the man underwater, and the next frame has him with his hand sticking up in his wallet in his hand. Is that the way we want to do it? Excluding all of our financial affairs, all of our business? It seems to me that it was, it, it, you know, Jacob's choice. God is committed to our liberty, and if we don't want him in, he will not force the issue. You may wish he had forced the issue, but he won't, because it's up to you. Time and chance will force the issue, and that's a rough way to go, believe me. Okay, drive a stake in the ground there, and let's go on to the next waypoint. Numbers 18. The Lord spoke to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any part among them. This is after the land is being divided out by lot among the twelve tribes. I am your part and your inheritance among the children of Israel. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance for their service which they serve 
even the tabernacle of the congregation. Question, how can you give something that isn't yours? Can't, can you? So when God gave the tithe to Levi, it's tacit that it was his to give. And indeed, it was. He had, men had been tithing to him from time immemorial, going all the way back to Abraham and for all we know before. Now, once the Levites were established and working, you gave what was due to God to the Levites because he said, I've given the Levites all the tenth. When the Levites leave the picture, what does it look like? Does the tithe go away? No. It belonged to God before Levi. It will belong to God after Levi. Nothing has changed regarding who owns this tithe that comes to him. For the simple truth of the matter is, we are sharecroppers, and we have the most generous deal any landowner ever gave to anybody. 10%. And everything else is yours to keep. Pretty simple. Well, leave a way marker there. Let's go on. There are a few technical details about tithing in the Old Testament I will leave you to sort out for yourself. Let's follow on to the New Testament. Luke 11, verse 42. Here's Jesus. Woe unto you, Pharisees, you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and you pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to have left the other undone. Whoops. Don't say or suggest that Jesus did not teach tithing, because right here he says it ought to be done, or it ought not to be left undone, whichever way you want to construct this particular passage of Scripture. We can dispense with that. Now, what about the obligation to give? Here's another example from Jesus. Luke 12, verse 16. Luke 12, 16. He spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, What am I going to do? I don't have a room to put all this stuff. I know what I'll do. I'll pull down my barns, build greater barns, and I'll bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul? You know who talks about himself? You know, soul like this, kind of stupid. Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then whose shall these things be which you have provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What can I tell you? Is it proportional? Sure, it's proportional. Rich man, rich toward God. That's what God expects of people. Poor man does what he can, and God will do as much with what the poor man gives as the rich man proportionally. Now, if I'm to give in accordance with the blessings of God, I can never reach that level. Completely impossible. I no way I could ever reach, reach that. You don't have to. All you got to do is reach a tenth. This is one of the great things in the Bible because you can actually wind up feeling, well, I just need to give everything away and, and so forth. People have done that. But no, that's not necessary. Reach the tenth. After that, consult your heart and consult to God. I knew a man in England years ago, came to counsel with me one Friday night about tithing. I was really taken aback by his honesty. I think he is probably the most honest man I have ever talked with at church. He said, Mr. Dart, I hate to tithe. I do it, but I grit my teeth and I hate it every time I do it. My reply to him was, then don't do it. He couldn't, he couldn't deal with that. I mean, he said, what? He thought I was being foolish. He thought I, I was kidding him or something, but I wasn't. I said, don't do it. It isn't going to do you a bit of good to do it if you're not doing it cheerfully. Do it, but it's not going to help. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, short, one short verse. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So... That's a part of the challenge. Now, I don't know what he ever did. Uh, I really don't. Uh, I got the impression that he was going to go on and tithe even after that. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, 
But in the law of Moses, there was no internal revenue service. There was no IRS. There were no priests going around auditing your books. There was nobody checking on you to see whether you tithe or whether you didn't. You don't want to tithe? Don't. But then you should consider one scripture from the Old Testament from the prophet. It's Malachi 3 and verse 8. And man, is this ever a stinger. Will a man rob God? What? Will a man rob God? Well, no. He says, yet you have robbed me. And you say, well, how have we robbed you? His answer, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. You've all robbed me. Bring the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, there shall not be room enough to receive it. Food in his house? What for? For you who put it there. That's what for. The priests were there to eat the offerings, to eat the bread, to do these things on behalf of God so that we the people would be able to learn how to give to God for no other purpose than for us to learn. Do this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed. You'll be a delightsome land. So it would seem that although there is no IRS to enforce the tithe, there are sanctions for not tithing because you've robbed God. And you can't rob somebody by taking something that belongs to you, can you? You only take, rob someone when you take what belongs to him. My friend in England who hated to tithe, I think continued to do it even though it galled him. Why did he do it? Because he knew the failure to tithe carried consequences. That's why he kept it up. I pray that somehow he worked his way all th on through that, but that's another story. But we're not quite done. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 6. In fact, we're not even close to done. Hebrews 6, verse 19. Paul wrote, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, I get more questions about this Melchizedek than you can shake stick at, but there isn't just a whole lot to know about him other than what we read here and back in Genesis. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and a priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. His name means king of righteousness, king of Salem, king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life. Like the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now, I've heard some really convoluted explanations of this, but it certainly reads to me like Melchizedek was not a mere mortal. He was an eternal person, an eternal being, when he showed up at Abraham's door. Abraham met him coming home from the slaughter of the kings. And, of course, Jesus also is an eternal being and is that high priest. I think most people, or a lot of people do at least, believe that Melchizedek, who met Abraham, was none other than the one we call Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in verse 4, Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires that the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people, that is their brothers, even though their brothers are also descended from Abraham just like they are. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi. Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. So Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. And to any Hebrew reader, that goes about as far as you can go. Because Abraham was the greatest. In the one case, the tenth, he says, is collected by men who die. In the other case, 
by him who is, is declared to be living. And the, the, the grammatical construction of this doesn't leave you a whole lot of wiggle room in this. There, in Abraham's case, he received it by one, one received it who is declared to be living, which again connects to Christ. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tithe, paid the tithe through Abraham because when Melchizedek made it, met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. If perfection could have been obtained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still a need for another priest to come, one after the order of Melchizedek, not the order of Aaron? Why indeed? I think that's an important question. Then he says, for when, the priest, when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. What law? Well, one example given here is the law that authorized Levi to take the tithe. So, and remember also about Levi, the tithe given to Levi was conditional. Did you notice it? It's given to him for his service which he performs. He isn't entitled to it if he's not working. So the Levite today, since he has no role to play, is not authorized to receive tithes any longer. But that doesn't mean that he who is of the priesthood of Melchizedek is not. He of whom these things are said belongs to a different tribe, Jesus, no one from that tribe that has ever served at the, at the altar, for it is clear our Lord descended from Judah, which I know gives some people heartburn to even think about the fact that Jesus was a Jew. Sorry, it's a fact. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear. If another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation having to do with Levi is set aside because it was weak and useless. The law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Now I am fully aware that there exist books full of arguments about Hebrews 6 and 7 and this whole thing, this chapter in particular. My question is, why argue about it? If you don't want to tithe, don't. It is as simple as that. If you are not persuaded that you should, why bother? And to those who will write me to debate this, this, this particular issue, my answer is going to be, why argue? If you don't want to tithe, don't do it. Same thing I told my old friend in Birmingham in England years ago. Don't. Well, to argue at this point is mere self-justification. I don't want to tithe. Now, here are all my reasons I will tick off for you why I won't. Okay, well, you don't need them. If you don't want to do it, don't. Now, to some practical questions about tithing. Before I make this, these things, I want to make one thing absolutely clear. This is entirely up to you, not me. Is that clear? Pray about it. Make a good decision in good faith. Number one question, should the poor tithe? You know, it's a funny question because in many cases, failure to acknowledge God is the reason why they're poor. You know, they've just gone wandering through life, taking no knowledge of him at all, and that's why they're there. You could almost ask a question, should a crippled man walk? What do I mean by that? Well, if he can, he should. It may only be in walking until his legs can gain strength. People who've had knee surgery have to go through rehab to build up strength. Walk, if you can. The poor should tithe as an act of faith. Remember what Jesus said of the woman who gave the last two pennies she had in the temple offering? What she gave was more than all the rest of these wealthy men had given. And God can take it and do more with it than he could with what they had. Oh, God can do what he wants to. It seems like he wants to do it that way. And it's, he's, after all, he is in charge. Uh, what if you have debts? There's another question. Let me put it to you this way. If, or, if after meeting your contracted debts, 
feeding and clothing your wife and children, meeting the, the expenses necessary to keep your job, gasoline for your car, you know, payment on the car, train fare to get you to work, whatever. If you have nothing left over it after that, you can't tithe. You got no money to tithe with because these obligations have soaked it all up. But if you have one dollar left, you don't spend it at Starbucks. You don't go by the donut shop. You don't do any luxuries. Only necessities should be taken until you have dug yourself out of the hole that you are in. Simple, isn't it? You don't take that dollar you have left over after you've met your obligations and spend it on yourself. Now, here's another question. Do I have to make up all the tithe I have not paid down through the years? Ha! It's the IRS that works that way. I doubt it. That's the meaning of grace. Unmerited pardon of our debts to God. Grace. No, you don't have to go back and correct all your misdeeds. You don't have to go back and apologize to everybody you hurt. You don't have to do all that sort of thing. You take it and you lay it before God. You say, I'm sorry for all this. I'm going to try to do better. And God will wipe it out for you, provided you follow through on one other thing. Did you ever notice this in the world's Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Isn't that interesting? We actually are going, asking God to forgive our debts. So consequently, if we owed him tithe for 30 years, we ask for that forgiveness, we can receive it, and we start over again. Doesn't mean, by the way, that everything's going to start working like clockwork, that you can go out and buy the cheapest oil penny stock from Canada you can find, and you're going to get rich with it. Uh-uh. You still are obligated to use your common sense, your best wisdom, and try to be wise with what God has given you. Next question. Where do I pay my tithe? Is it okay to give it to the poor? First of all, when and how you tithe and where you tithe is between you and God. I will say this about giving to the poor. Be sure they know that this is coming to them in Jesus' name. It isn't coming to them because you're a nice person. It isn't coming to them out of the blue, out of nowhere. It's coming to them in Jesus' name. You don't do it that way, you're not tithing. Not really. Jesus did say, and as much as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. I think he does expect us to do these things for the poor. But we are supposed to do them ourselves for the poor, not pay somebody else to do it, not pass it on to some other organization which promises they will do it. You do it yourself is what he's telling you. I'm telling you. Paul said, Galatians 6, verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially to them of the household of faith. Opportunity is the interesting word in this case. I think what he means by opportunity is that we do it personally. The person comes across our path. We encounter this person and we have a chance to make a difference in his life. We can do that, but we should do it in Jesus' name, making it very clear that this is coming to him for that reason, not for any other. I do not recommend giving to the poor through a third party. It's it can it just too, too easy for it to go astray. How do I start to tithe? First, talk it over with God. Then get out a pad and pencil and start laying out your life. Put down all the dollars and cents and debts and obligations and everything. Put it all down on paper so you can actually look at it. Then you can do what Isaiah did. Not Isaiah. Hezekiah? I think it was Hezekiah. Went into the temple one day with a letter from the Assyrians and he laid it out before God and said, look here what this man has said. What you do is you take that, pay, pay, that pad in there and, and lay it out before God and say, this is what I'm up against. And I'm going to try to do the best thing I can possibly do. Put God first in your life is the thing. I would say put God ahead of your house payment, but you gave your word on that house payment and you got to keep your word. Don't you? You signed a contract. You are obligated. You got to do it. The same is true of all contracted obligations. Get out your checkbook and start paying attention to where stuff goes. Or maybe I should say get out your credit card statement and consider where you've been spending all this money out here. Cut off 
every expense you have that you don't absolutely have to have. Just stop it. As I said, don't go to Starbucks with that extra buck. Don't go to luxuries. If you can't tithe, don't allow yourself any luxuries. Live on the necessities of life. To the best of your ability, after meeting contracted obligations, taking care of the minimum needs of your family, set aside something for God. Plan for the day when you can work that up to the 10th. And you will be surprised what a difference that will make in your life. You don't have to have a BMW. Sell it and buy a used Chevrolet. That's the way you ought to go. Avoid paying interest on anything except basic housing and basic transportation. One of the biggest mistakes we have made in our society nowadays is the interest we pay on stuff so we can have it now. I, I, once upon a time, I, I was doing something for the teens up in Oklahoma, and I worked them something out on paper. I don't have it now. But what I did, I said, let's supposing you were just got married, you and your wife are, are getting stuff for your little household, and you go out and you max out your credit cards. Next month, you pay off what you have to pay and run them back up to max again. And then you next month, you do the same and the same and the same. Fifty years from now, you should look at your statement and see how much you have actually paid for that first round of stuff you put in your house. It will blow your mind. Okay, we got to have a house. we got to have a place to live. Yeah, you do. Sit on the floor. You can sit on the floor. Get a mattress. Look, put it on the floor in the bedroom. You can sleep on a mattress on the floor. You can even sleep on the floor if you have to. If you need a bookshelf, get some concrete blocks and a, and a one by six and put it over there and put your books on it. Stop thinking you have got to have everything in the world and, and, and using credit to buy it when you're getting started out in life. Because here is the biggest lesson to learn of all about all this stuff. The thing that makes the difference is the amount of time you have for the stuff that you have to build. And if you every day that you're in debt, you are wasting that time. It's amazing what $100 put away today will amount to if you're a 20-year-old, when you get to 65, if you, you and I, I figured it out once you can work in McDonald's from now until the time you're 65, a 20-year-old, making minimum wage the whole times, be a millionaire when you're 65. If you play your cards right and don't use credit cards and don't waste money on stuff you don't need to have. Can you get McDonald's free if you work there? Might be able to. If so, you got to got, got something going for you right there. Anyway, cut off every expense you don't have to have. Meet your con contracted obligations and, and your minimum needs of your family, and then set aside something for God with what is left. Plan for the day to get it all back up, you know, to get where it is a tithe. If you can't afford to tithe, what else is on that pad or in that checkbook that you can't afford? You can't afford to tithe. What else is there you can't afford? Because I'll guarantee you, if you can't afford to tithe, you've got money going out for other stuff you can't afford either. This is your job. One of the greatest lessons that come to the tither is a really simple, down-to-earth truth. You may want to write this down, because I really hate for you to lose it. I can live on less than my entire income. I'll get it again in case you didn't get it the first time. I can live on less than my entire income. That's what we learn when we start finally tithing, is that we don't have to spend every dime we make on ourselves. Wow. Who'd have thought it?